All right, so this class, uh, Romans, Grace in the Book of Romans. This is lesson number three in that series. And as far as the book itself or the epistle itself, we're covering uh, the section that includes chapter one, verse one, to chapter three, verse 23. Um, and this is uh, the title of this lesson, Renouncing of Grace, part two. So let's uh, do a bit of review. Uh, concerning what we've talked about so far, um, uh, concerning the subject of grace in the book of Romans. So first of all, we've said that God's original expression of grace is the creation itself and man's position at the head of it. Uh, and his participation, in other words, man's participation in the divine nature and the intimate contact that he was allowed and, and gifted with uh, with, with God. So that's, you know, when we say grace, it means a lot of things, but the initial expression of God's grace includes all of this, the creation, man's position, man's role, all of this is God's initial expression of grace. Then we said that the initial fall from grace or the renunciation of grace came when man disobeyed God and in, and in doing so he clouded his own nature. He undermined his position at the head of creation and he rendered himself unable to directly communicate with God. You know, it's as if he put blinders on, couldn't see God, couldn't understand who God was anymore because of the fall. And so in Romans chapter one, Paul describes the process of this fall from a, what we said a macrocosmic view, in other words, a big picture view throughout history. And we said that this, this, this cycle of, of falling, if you wish, or this, this renunciation of grace resulting in a fall from grace is cyclical in nature. And in Romans chapter one, Paul describes this cycle throughout history, uh, an overview, if you wish. And there were three, you know, three main points of reference. The first, of course, a theological fall. A theological fall happened and happens when man refuses to acknowledge God as God. That's a theological fall. And man refuses to give thanks to God. If you don't, if you don't accept who God is, if you don't acknowledge who He is, well, it's, you know, it's very easy then to drift into not being thankful, not being grateful. The second step, if you wish, in this cycle is a philosophical fall. And so man begins to worship something other than God. Man begins to create for himself ideas that try to replace God or that try to explain reality without reference to God. So that's a philosophical fall. And then that is followed by a moral fall. Man plunges deeply into active evil. Why? Because he didn't see God, because he's created something other than God to replace God. That always leads to a moral fall. And by a moral fall, I, I, I mean not knowing what is right from wrong, doing things that are wrong. Now, one thing I didn't mention last week is that God's renewed expression of grace throughout history, God doesn't just express His grace one time. I mean, the first time He expresses His grace, yes, that's creation and man and man's position in it. That's not the only time He expresses His grace. Throughout history, God renews His expressions of grace and those expressions of grace have always centered around the promise of Christ to come. So from the Garden of Eden to the cross of Christ, God's renewed expression of grace was always the hope of the first coming of Christ, told by the prophets, continually stirring up the people to hope and faith with this promise that one day the Messiah would come. Now from the cross until the end of time or until the end of the world, God's renewed expression of grace has centered on the promise of the return uh, of Jesus. 
Uh, and this has been the thing that has renewed men's hearts, that has given individuals hope. So God renews always throughout history His expression of grace, but that renewal is always the promise of Jesus. In the Old Testament, a promise of Jesus coming and what He would do when He would come. In the New Testament, the promise of Jesus and what He will do when He comes. And of course, what He will do when He comes is resurrect us from the dead. And that resurrection, that, that's the hope that we, that we have. So in Romans chapter one, Paul talks about man's moral failure and the kinds of things that uh, that, that failure has led man to do. That's in chapter one. In chapters two and three, he's going to describe God's judgment and how that judgment applies to individuals. So in chapter two, Paul summarizes how God will judge every single person that ever lived. And he does this by first of all, dividing up the world into two parts. First part, the Jews. The Jews, all the legitimate descendants of Abraham, the Jews. The other part are the Gentiles, sometimes referred to as the Greeks. Well, that's everybody else, not just people who come from Greece. Everybody, so you have the Jews and the Gentiles, or the Jews and the Greeks, referring less to a culture, more to a philosophy, and more to a, a state of mind, if you wish. And so God's judgment of these individuals is described in chapter two, verses five to 16. So let's read a couple of verses here, start off in chapter two, beginning in verse five. Paul says, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. So let's just stop there for a second. Paul says that everyone who pursues good, now you have to remember, good according to God's standard of what is good. You know, not, not, not good what I think is good, pursues good according to God, what God says is good. And of course the law given to the Jews, that determines what is good. So he says everyone who pursues good and does so in the understanding that they're seeking a life with God. And the life with God he describes as honor, glory, immortality. He says everyone who pursues the good that God describes and does it in order to be with God, he said, these people will have eternal life. Well, eternal life is the same thing as being saved. If you're saved, you get eternal life. If you have eternal life, it means you're saved. Just another way of saying you'll be saved. Now, remember, not a life according to what we think is good, but one lived according to what God thinks is good and doing it consciously. So Paul says succeeding at this will save one's soul. Both Jews and Gentiles who do this, he says, they'll be saved. All right, let's look at verse eight. He says, but to those, excuse me, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, remember God's truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath and indignation. So those who do not obey the truth, the truth given by God, and who follow their own way, these will be subject to God's exercise of angry punishment. Well, if God is angry and punishes you, that means you're, you're lost. Let's keep reading, verses nine to 11. He says, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. Verse 10 but glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. So God will judge every man according to this principle. Those who seek and obey His truth will be blessed and those who do not will be cursed. 
and all will be judged alike, both Jew and Gentile. Okay? So he set out the parameters here of judgment. So let's keep reading. Verse 12, he says, for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Verse 13, for it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be judged. So Gentiles who have not received the law of Moses are still responsible to what's called the principle of the law. The principle of the law which exists in their conscience and in nature, which clearly reveals God's presence and clearly reveals God's demands. So this principle does not articulate and reveal God as clearly as the Jewish law did, but it does place moral and ethical demands on individuals nevertheless. For example, without the written law of Moses, we know intuitively that killing our parents is not right. Murdering your mother, you don't have to have the law of Moses to point out to you, thou shalt not kill. Murdering your mother, or murdering your neighbor to steal his goods, you know intuitively by the quote principle of law, you know that that's not okay. So the Jews, they're clearly under the law of Moses and Paul says they'll be judged according to this law. But the law of Moses does not contradict the principle of law. It simply articulates it more clearly and amplifies it more clearly. In other words, it's much easier with the law of Moses to understand clearly what it is that God wants. But it doesn't mean that people who were not exposed to the law of Moses did not have a principle of law that guided them. So Paul explains that the judgment is based not on the sophistication and clarity of the rule that you have, whether it's the principle of law or the revealed law. No, he explains that the judgment is based on how we respond to what we have. If you have the principle of law and that's all you have, you'll be judged on how you responded to the principle of law. If you have the revealed law, then you'll be judged on how you responded to the revealed law. All right, let's read 14, 15, 16. He says, for when Gentiles, who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves. So the principle of law, you see it? Verse 15, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternative, alternately accusing or else defending them on the day when according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. So who is he talking about? He's talking about Gentiles have not been you know, uh, exposed to the revealed law of Moses, but he's saying, but they still have a law that guides their conscience. In other words, he's saying their conscience is guiding them. So Paul explains how and why Gentiles are subject to both salvation and condemnation by demonstrating that what saves them or condemns them is their response to the principle of law directed through their conscience and nature under which they live. And he says that when they obey their law, they are righteous. Just as when the Jews obey the Mosaic law, they are righteous. So in the final verses, he explains that the things that make a person pleasing to God are not the externals of religion or the level of religious sophistication that one aspires to. You know, Jewish law revealed God more exactly than the mere principle of law. However, how one responded to the law that he lived under, this is the basis of judgment that Paul talks about. Now, please, do not get ahead of me here, okay? Just stay with me. He, remember, Paul is explaining principles here. The principles by which all individuals will be judged. 
So in chapter three, he's going to describe how well the Jews and how well the Gentiles have responded to the systems of law under which they lived. Okay. So we begin in chapter three, verse one. He says, then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect. First of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. What then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? In other words, he says, if Jews who have the, 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 the revealed law disobey it, doesn't make God you know, a failure, doesn't make the law a failure because they didn't obey it. Nothing wrong with the law, nothing wrong with God. He says, may it never be, rather let God be found true, though every man be found a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I am speaking in human terms. May it never be, for otherwise, how will God judge the world? But if through my lie, the truth of God abounded to His glory, why am I also still being judged as a sinner? And why not say, as we are slanderously reported and as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may come. No, their condemnation is just. So Paul begins chapter three by explaining that although the Jews had a true advantage in a greater clarity of God's will because they had the law of Moses and it was given to them and it was meant to be an advantage for them. They were after all God's chosen people. He chose them. He gave them an advantage. Well, Paul says even though they had the oracles of God, even though they had this advantage, the Jews did not respond with righteousness to it. Now the only thing their advantage produced was to show how good God was. How did, how did it show how good God was? Well, the history of the Jews was recorded. And anyone who read the history of the Jews saw what God did. He chose one person, Abraham, and he blessed that person and he you know, created a whole nation and he gave them a religion and a law and an identity and, 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 and witness of his power, the miracles that, that, that saved them from Egyptian bondage and he gave them a land. You know, over and over again he interceded in history to bless this people. Anybody who reads that can tell, wow, God was really good to these people. So he's saying <laughs> the only advantage for the Jews to have had the revealed law in the end was simply to demonstrate how God was good. That's not what God meant to do. You know what I'm saying? He didn't want them to sin. But in the end, that's the, the only good that came out of it. Okay. Now some were saying that if God was glorified by the revelation of the law and his dealing with disobedient Jews, then why was he condemning him? After all, he is being glorified, isn't he? After all, he's getting what he wanted. He wanted to be glorified, so he's being glorified. Why punish the Jews? And so Paul responds that this kind of thinking says that evil somehow glorifies God and is somehow okay, and those who are warped enough to think this way, well, they deserve condemnation. They deserve to go to hell if that's what you think God is all about. That he would do all of this for this people simply to honor himself. You know, it's kind of a, accusing God of thinking the end justifies the means. Who, care, who cares if these people are condemned? Who cares if these people are lost? I don't care. I'm being glorified. That's kind of what they were accusing. You know, what they were saying happened. And Paul is saying, God doesn't work like that. It isn't the end justifies the means for God. It's not the way it worked. So in verses 9 to 18, he summarizes the universal condemnation due to all men 
one that was spoken of in the Old Testament and renewed in the New Testament by Paul. So let's read verse nine. He says, what then? Are we better than they? When he says they, we, we the Jews. Are we better than they, they, the Gentiles, the Greeks? So he says, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. So Paul is saying here, both groups have failed to live up to the standard of law under which they stood. And so therefore, all are condemned. Now they're condemned not because they, the Gentiles, didn't become Jews or they don't know about Jesus. They're condemned because of what they did. And God doesn't condemn us because of what we don't know or don't do. He condemns us for what we do. So for the Jews, even with the advantage of revelation, they failed to respond properly. And the Gentiles, even though the bar was much lower for them, they failed to live up to the standard that they had as far as conscience is concerned, as far as nature or creation is concerned. They didn't even live up to that. They didn't even live up to their own conscience. Never mind the revealed law of God. Remember what I told you, don't get ahead of me? What I meant was don't think that I'm you know, uh, putting forth an apology here you know, for people to be saved without Christ. Because it sounds like that. What Paul was doing was explaining there was a way to be saved. For the Jews, live according to the revealed law. For the Gentiles, live according to the natural law or the principle of law. That's, that's how you'll be saved. So in verse 10 to 12, he says, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Can you twist this passage here to say some will be saved? Some were okay? Not even one, he says. There is none who understands, none who seeks God. All have become useless, none who does good, not even one. So the Holy Spirit, using the words of David, penned centuries before uh, before Paul's time anyways, declares that God, knowing every single heart, judges that none seek Him, none desire honor, goodness, and eternal life. No matter what the outside looks like, God tells us that this is the condition of the heart. So according to this passage, there is no it's a term, a noble savage. It was an argument, philosophical argument. The noble savage looking for God. People would say, you know, what about the Chinese person you know, in the fourth century? Will that person be condemned? They're, they're living in the middle of China, you know, in a small village in China, in the fourth century. <laughs> you know, we know the apostles, they didn't go they didn't go to China, they, they, went to, you know, they went west. What about that guy? Does his ignorance save him? Will he be condemned? Well, the answer is, well, yeah, sadly so. Why? Well, because he could know God through the witness of his own conscience and nature. Paul said that in Romans 1.19. Secondly, God says through the Spirit, He did not respond to the principle of law under which He lived. Romans 3, 23. You know, how do we know this to be true? Are we not judging people when we say that? Isn't that terrible? Well, no, I'm, I'm not judging anybody. I'm merely reading what Paul says about how God is going to judge. That's why I said, can you take that passage and twist it any way around where it'll say that some people are saved and others are, well, he says none. And what he's saying is that God has examined every heart. He hasn't found one looking for, remember, he didn't say, God didn't find some nice people in different places. 
there are plenty of nice people, even a lot of good people, you know, wouldn't hurt anyone, kind. God is looking for the kind of righteousness according to His goodness, remember? Not our, our, not our definition of goodness. His level of goodness is, is great. So God assures us that He has examined every heart and none were seeking for Him. Romans 3 that we read there, 10 to 12. We don't have to judge. God has already done so and recorded the results for, for everyone to see. So the argument continues, but, 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 but what if, what if someone says, what if somebody really, really wanted, what would happen in some remote spot? What if? Well, the Hebrew writer answers that question. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Those who respond to God in conscience, nature, law, those who really search for him there, the writer here says, they will find him. They can find him. From Seth to the patriarchs, to the nation of Israel, and now to the church, God has always had his people as a light to draw to him those who searched for him. So in any age or in any place, if someone is looking for God, God will find them. He is not blind. He's not weak. And to tell you the truth, one of the things, you know, there are a lot of blessings working with uh, you know, Bible talk, things like that. You know, you're, you know you're, you're preaching the gospel using digital media, media. But one of the great things about it that renews our faith, both Hal and I, are the, the letters, the emails that we get from people, the most obscure places. You know, a lady in Iran who cannot have a Bible, but who manages to read and learn and was secretly baptized you know, because of what she learned online. You know, people searching for God, God finds a way to find them. And today, a little plug for Bible talk, but today we have this digital media that goes all over the world. So anyone out there searching, and obviously our ministry is not the only one that's doing this, there are plenty of other uh, people who are preaching and teaching God's word online. You know, we're not the only guys. But today it's even easier to find if you're looking because the technology has given us this great tool to use. So God's arm is not so short that he can't reach and find that person. And you know, no matter where they are, you know, soldiers out in the field, you know, people living in villages, people living uh, under oppression, find a way to contact us. People not in our culture, from Japan, from, you know, from, from the Middle East, from South America, not even in our culture. So let's, this is a, this is a, a difficult, when I say difficult, I don't necessarily mean difficult to understand, it's difficult to accept. It's a hard teaching. People are lost. We don't, we want, we don't want to think that. We actually want to think there's some other way that God is going to save people that he hasn't told us about. Do you find yourself thinking that? Why? Because you know, it's hard to think that people will be without God. We have him, we know him, we're blessed by him. We would want everyone to have him. So let's summarize what Paul has said here, a hard teaching. First of all, all men have renounced grace and are caught in a cycle of theological, philosophical, and moral failure. And they're in this cycle from generation to generation. It just keeps going round and round and round and round. Knowing this is helpful because it helps us not to be so discouraged. Remember I told you once you hit the bottom of the moral, you know, moral failure, Usually that's followed by revival of some kind, some spiritual revival. God renews the church and evangelism. You know, it's happened throughout history. Or if it gets so bad at some point, you know, the man of lawlessness appears, then it won't be long. This is all over anyways. 
So we mustn't be discouraged by that. It doesn't mean we're quiet and not do anything, but we just keep doing what we do. Preach the gospel, teach people, call people out of the world, into the kingdom, into safety. So Paul has said that all men have renounced grace. Secondly, all are condemned from Adam until the end of the world. There is no one that actually escapes condemnation. They do not escape condemnation because of ignorance. Ignorance is no excuse. All have knowledge of God either through the principle of law inherent in nature and conscience or through direct revelation, whether it be the law of Moses in, in that time period or today through the church. And today in you know, Western industrialized countries, there is no excuse. And the gospel of Christ really has been preached thoroughly and has been thoroughly rejected thoroughly rejected by modern man, especially in the Western world. So ignorance is no excuse and innocence, a claim to innocence. You know, God has and does examine every heart and reveals to us in advance that no one searches for Him. No one is innocent of, of sin. So the conclusion is that all have renounced God's initial expression of grace and stand condemned for it unless we understand and accept the universality of condemnation, a hard teaching. But unless we accept that, a couple of things we can't do. Unless we accept the universality of condemnation, we cannot appreciate God's response of grace in sending Jesus. I mean, if condemnation is only partial, even just one exception, then Jesus is only a partial savior and Christianity is just one of a lot of different solutions. And I'll tell you, it's one of the reasons why our religion is losing its power today. The reason is it is not seen as the answer and the only answer. The minute you start saying, well, you know, it's one of the answers. <laughs> well, if it's one of the answers, you know, maybe there's some other answers. We've stopped preaching that all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've stopped preaching that because it's politically incorrect, because it's uncomfortable, because it seems cruel. And consequently, our preaching also has been watered down. It's not effective. It's not effective. Secondly, Unless we accept the universality of condemnation, we, can, we, we, we uh, cannot accept the um, Great Commission. I mean, the Great Commission takes on urgency and meaning if all are lost, if all have sinned. We got to do something about that. I've once told you the reason I went into preaching wasn't because I liked public speaking. There are a lot of easier uh, you know, things to do in life using public speaking other than being a preacher. Actually, the public speaking part, that's the easy part. <laughs> the studying part is the more difficult part. <laughs> you know, when we have to go because people will perish without the gospel and they won't find it by themselves, we begin to see why evangelism is the priority of the church. Why evangelism is the main reason for the existence of the church. All the programs that we have okay, in the church, almost all of them, are to help the faithful remain faithful. But if you don't have a strong program that actually goes out and preaches to the lost, it'll be pretty soon that the faithful will start to dwindle. There won't be anything left. Because the thing that stimulates our faithfulness is evangelism. It's the thing that gets us excited. Supporting missionaries, going on missionary trips, inviting somebody to church, seeing people being baptized, new Christians. You know, that's, what, that's the energy that keeps the church strong and vibrant. 
And the universality of condemnation is a sobering thought that helps us appreciate our own salvation and those who have brought us to Christ, those who labor to keep us there. You know, I appreciate what I have when I see how close I was to condemnation. Ever think, boy, what if my parents were not Christians and took me to church or taught me? Would I have found it by myself? What if my friend didn't persist in inviting me to come to church picnic and bring my kids to VBS so that I would eventually come to worship service and hear the gospel and be, what if she, you know, what if she didn't do that? Would I have searched? You know, ask yourself the what if question. That person that steered you to Christ, what if that didn't happen? Where would you be? Remember I've told you before, the only advantage of having been converted at 30 years of age, as was the case in my life, the only advantage of that is I can remember what it's like to be lost. I can remember that. I can remember what I would be thinking about and the searching and the, and, you know, I can remember the state of mind of a person who is lost, doesn't, he have, doesn't even have a clue about salvation. You know, religion, ah, it's just religion, Jesus freaks, you know, whatever, I'm not interested in that. You know, it has no relevance in my life. You know, I can remember thinking that. And if it wasn't for you know, Jim Metter, missionary for a little tiny church, 30 people in Lachine in Montreal, putting a small little column ad in a, a weekly giveaway newspaper that said sinners are welcome at the Church of Christ. And he wrote a little article about how sinners are welcome at the church. And I looked at that article and I went, that's me, he's talking about me. And I went to visit and you know, you know the rest of the story. And I've told you before, that's the only time that that ad was in the paper. It only appeared one time and I'm the only person that answered that ad, no one else. Jim is gone, that church no longer exists, and yet I, because of God's grace, have preached the gospel to millions of people. <laughs> millions, imagine, why? Because a preacher preaching for some tiny little church stepped out and took a chance and wrote an article and what if, he wouldn't have done, what if I would have missed that? Where would I be now? Think about that. Your parents, your friend, your cousin, your brother, who, whoever steered you to Christ, where would you be without that person? So we appreciate what we have when we realize, of course, what we could have lost. All right, so in the next chapters, Paul's going to explain God's response to universal condemnation. And that is a renewal of the expression of grace, this time not through the creation, but through the sending of, of Jesus Christ. And that'll be our next, uh, our next lesson in grace. I believe that's it, I heard the bell. That's our time, appreciate your attention.